this. So, any questions? Yes. Oh no, that's me. Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. One question is just for uh, Tim Anderson. Um, Tim. Tim, you just want to mention there about the um, the legality of execution of prisoner combatants. Um, my understanding of uh, of the legality of that is that um, if a, any combatant is in uniform, is um, fighting on behalf of another state, in the army of the United States, then he has protection under uh, with a Geneva Convention or whatnot mm. just to be executed. But, however, an enemy combatant who isn't in uniform mm. or isn't wearing any sort of uniform that um, yeah, connects him to another state that Well, you're just talking about a criminal then in that case, basically. But that, to execute a criminal is a crime too. Uh, no, I think it's clearly a war crime to execute prisoners. But uh, there, there are, sorry. Would they, would they not come under the uh, jurisdiction of the law of the state? Uh, yes, yes. But then, uh, as I understand, the Syrian law, while it has a death penalty, doesn't actually, uh, doesn't allow for extrajudicial execution. I was going to say that this is the kind of situation that arose in um, Afghanistan when the United States invaded that country and that there are international conventions that protect prisons. So the, the Bush, Bush administration argued that the Geneva Conventions didn't apply in that case, but the third common protocol to those conventions, which you can look at, essentially provides a baseline of protections even if they have no other status. So there was no black hole, and that was kind of the controversy of the Bush administration's arguments at the time, so there was a black hole, but the third common article of the Geneva Conventions does provide basic principles which would create war crimes if um, there were executions going on during this conflict. So with the, with the Afghanistan case, the, I mean, the, the uh, American army to invasionary force executing indigenous populations. I mean, that, I don't know how you look at that, okay, it's not in there, but this is a case where you've got to say foreign fighters, even local fighters. It's the fact that they can... Western uh, definition. That, it was a similar thing like combatants, and they weren't necessarily native fighters in Afghanistan either. Um, so it was the fact that they're combatants, and so that was basically the definition. And there's still some that's un, somewhat unsettled still, but the, the, the common argument is that you can't interpret the international law to say that there's a gap that people fall between. And so again, it comes back to these unique conventions. And so um, it means that because of their enemy combatant status, it doesn't really matter so much whether there's the invading force versus the, what's potentially a civil war here. Anyone else? Yes? Yeah, uh, my question's for Malcolm. Um, you propose that because uh, the Assad regime no longer controlled the Rafah area um, and the Iraqi army has invited the US to uh, do airstrikes on ISIS, um, therefore, under international law, it is legal for them to strike within um, Raqqa. Does that, uh, does that suggest or propose that, therefore, Raqqa is no longer a sovereign area of Syria? In, in a sense, yes. Um, it's, this is a very new area of the law. Essentially, as I said, the United States has long pushed this argument and it's never really been accepted. Uh, but actually, this argument was put forward by Samantha Powers, the UN ambassador, um, as the basis for um, why the United States argued it was legal to go into Syria. And when they said that, uh, I note that UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon responded that, I'm aware that today's strikes were not carried out at the direct request of the Syrian government, but I note that the government was informed beforehand also note that the strikes took place in areas no longer under the effective control of that government. And so, if you're thinking sort of as a legal theoretical matter, yes, it's to do with the fact that there's no effective sovereignty by the Assad government in that part of the country. But if they were to regain that sovereignty, then the authority to intervene there by the United States would end for that reason. Can I add something to that? that um, I think it's based on a, on a false premise, the, that argument, because... Um, uh, well, it's a self-referential argument within the US, basically, but the Syrian army has certainly made a priority in the major populated areas of the west of Syria, but they've always had a presence in the east, in, uh, up to the north in Hasaka and Deir ez and also including in Raqqa, where, the, where their presence was less strong. Uh, they've always been there and on the border too, so it, it's really, it was an argument of convenience set up. In the back? <laughs> um, I want to ask Malcolm, you would basically admit that um, the arming, training and funding of terrorists or death squads or Contras to go into another country is illegal. You 
say that that has both been carried out in your first and second examples, that would lead to a situation where either those people transform into ISIS, which seems to be the problem that America feels it can lead to bomb, or they've tied up the Syrian forces so that the ISIS can flow in through Turkey and take out Raqqa. So suddenly you have, if you carry out a series of illegal acts, you've reached a point where miraculously at the third step you're suddenly doing something legal. Um, without any connection from the first to the third. So did you have a question? So whether or not that's well, a correct statement. statement. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so, so the, I'll just want to that, that um, the way the international law works isn't that two, right, two wrongs make a right or that uh, the fact that the United States is now, I argue, acting legally has in any way made those other actions legal. I'm not suggesting that at all. Those are still illegal Even actions that are took. Even illegal acts, the uh, Syrians could regain control or prevent ISIS being there in the first place. So this is the... So they have created the situation to be able to go and attack Syria based on illegal acts, which you are now claiming have transformed themselves into legal acts because someone said, can you help us from Ali Adif on the other country too? I, I'm not saying I mean, that it's any way transformed into legal This does sound like international law as proposed by Samantha Power. It is, yes, it's the argument yeah. that Samantha Power put forward. Well, so, one of the experts. It's in no way converting the legal, the illegal acts into legal acts. That's still illegal. That's, nothing changes that. And, you know, so potentially, under, well, as you know, under international law, powerful so states generally aren't prosecuted. So. You are now saying it is illegal to bomb Syria just because ISIS is in Raqqa? Because you weren't saying that before. No, I no, I'm changing my position. It's still legal. I say, but it's got no foundation in logic. No. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. 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 Has been recorded. Has it has been recorded that uh, more than hundred times that the uh, U.S. military planes have dropped in military aids to the ISIS area. Has been recorded by the Iraqi government, and lately. Uh, when the uh, uh, Iraqi army and the, the Iraqi population uh, resistance, which is they love and to, to liberate uh, Takhrib, uh, in certain way that the, the uh, American uh, uh, war planes has uh, has uh, attacked the uh, Iraqi uh, Iraqi army positions, and uh, 50, 50 uh, people has been killed, 50 army has been killed, and. Again, and I have evidence that ISIS has been made and created by ISIS. I mean, I've come across this argument, certainly. <coughs> I've had extensive discussions with some Syrian friends about this, and that's the argument that they've put forward, is that the United States um, has um, funded ISIS directly or indirectly. So, I don't know how common a view that is. Um, <coughs> Certainly, there's no question that American money has made its way through to ISIS. There's no question about that. Through some of the Gulf states in particular, through Saudi Arabia, is one of America's key allies. In terms of the argument that America is more directly involved, which is the other that has been put forward, that um, ISIS is a more direct creation of the United States, I, I don't find plausible evidence for that. Um, it essentially, I, I, the idea that there's some grand the plug, strategy. Where's the plug? Tried general uh, of USA Army said in an interview with CNN, he said directly, he said ISIS got started to do funding from our friends and allies to fight to death against Hezbollah that became a Pakistan monster. This is Wesley Clark. Yeah, I mean, Hillary Clinton has also had Senate testimony, which is really available online, which talks about the fact that in America's attempt to fight. Um, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan and Pakistan during the Cold War, the Mujahideen, were funded by the United States, and that money eventually made its way back into the groups that the United States fought later. This certainly happens, that these groups change allegiances. Uh, that's part of the reason why I was my, my personal conclusion was that I think it was a bad idea to try and start funding rebels in Syria because that's what could happen in the longer term. I'm going to add something there, but um, the, it, it's more direct than Wesley Clark or Hillary Clinton because the current head of the US military, um, Martin Dempsey, has admitted that the, uh, the Saudis and, uh, and Turkey have been supporting ISIS directly, and Vice President Biden said it also. So if, if the close allies of the US in that, in that conflict 
are doing that and the US knows about it, we can't really pretend that they're innocent or they're acting independently of the US. You know? so, but of course there is this gulf because of Western culture, people don't really want to believe there's a direct link, even though it's been admitted by the Vice President and, and the head of the army. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, very uh, quick follow-up to the previous uh, question regarding uh, the right under the international law to engage in an area of territory that is no longer under the control of the government. Now, it would seem that that would be reasonably clear-cut in terms of determining control over the ground. But, for example, um, an important part of modern uh, war would be air defence zones, etc. So, for example, my understanding um, would be that those areas would still be under, um, for example, Syrian um, radar and surface to air battery coverage, and therefore any uh, uh, unauthorised um, uh, incursion by a by a by a plane or by a jet or by a drone would um would in one sense degrade that that defence capability. I don't want to speculate too much about this idea because, as I say, the way international law works is it does develop over, over time, but it requires states to agree to that development. And I'm suggesting that some states have agreed to that. But So the full dimensions of this particular principle aren't fleshed out. But I would note that part of the principle is that um, Assad himself has acquiesced to these attacks in the north of Iraq. So, uh, oh, sorry, Syria. That um, he has said that there hasn't been tactical information given, but there have been communications so that his forces aren't in the air at the time. And this is why the countries have moved closer to, in, um, not an alliance, but working together in some ways um, without direct communication necessarily. I'm going to quibble a little bit with that because um, the, the information we've passed on by the Iraqi government to, to Syria about, so they've been informed, there's been a lot of reports on it, they've been informed, but they haven't been consulted. And they've constantly uh, protested it as a violation of their sovereignty. Um, but Very quietly. But because the... Um, well, they're not reported in the Western media, generally speaking, but because there is this also... It's quite a complex situation. Because there is this tacit agreement with the Russians and so on, which, which offset the, 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 the issue back in September 2013, um, it, it's a type of limited intervention which might attract some support, and some people seem to support it, um, uh, that the US has, has calculated, basically, that it'll be tolerated, basically. Um, up, to, up to what point, who knows? But you see that the Syrians have had to tolerate missile attacks from Israel at the same time and, uh, and restrain themselves because they are fighting on a number of fronts at once. I mean, the Syrian army is fighting on at least five fronts at the moment and, and, the, and the, the eastern part of Syria is the, the fifth or the sixth front. Yes. I, um, I had a question for Well, I've spent a lot of time in Damascus, and so, I mean, especially now with all the displaced people, uh, areas are less defined than what they were before. So people, you know, the, the, the Sunnis who fled Aleppo from the militants have now gone to Latakia and Tartus, and that's going to be an Alawite area. And the same has happened with, um, with, with Damascus. Damascus pretty much had all sects living inside but, you know, with the countryside being taken over by these rebels, a lot of the residents have come into Damascus and from places such as Jalbat and Duma. And um, so they, they were so many people who were in Damascus. And some of my closest friends are Sunnis. Um, everyone, pretty much most of the people I met in Damascus were, were Sunnis. I didn't go to any areas that obviously being held by the rebels because I wouldn't have come out alive. Um, but, you know, if Sunni represent 70% maybe more of Syria's population, and it's ridiculous to suggest that President Assad does not have the support of 70% of his population because without the support of his population, he wouldn't still be around. And if there is one body that does have more support than President Assad in Syria, that is the Syrian army. The army that the West, uh, you know, continuously accuses of committing these crimes. 
Um, so yeah, that, that was the impression that I got while I was there. And the army is majority? Of course, yeah, the majority, yeah, because, you know, there's construction in Syria, I so. Su I suppose the reason why I asked also about the future, I suppose what's happening now, the future solution in Syria, that Syria will continue to be united, which I think is very important. Of course, that is very important, and that's one of the things that makes, that made Syria what it is, you know. Um, while we're in Malula, Obviously, that's a Christian town, but Muslims were living there. We spoke to Muslims and we spoke to Christians. And after all the um, the damage to the churches and the, and the destruction that the Christian community suffered in Malula, I always asked them, do you think Syria will go back to what it was before? And they said, it definitely will. They pretty much blame what's happening, not on Islam or the Muslims. They say these people came from outside. And so... There's, there's no bad blood between Christians and Muslims in Syria. The, the danger of this war, however, going on for longer, I mean, it's been four years, the longer it goes on, I fear that that will happen. Okay, this question is for Tim. Um, Tim, why do you believe that the US and some of the Gulf states have um, taken up such a hostile stance against Syria? The um, US and who? The US Arab and the, some of the Arab states and, and Turkey as well. Um, why do you believe they've taken such a hostile stance against Syria? And also, just in relation to that question, in terms of the United States, um, it's quite evidence, evident that they have such a strong relationship with Saudi Arabia, who have one of the most disgusting human rights records in the world. Yet they're so mainstream media that um, likes to portray Bashar al Assad as a dictator, which bring clearly just make clear that he has a lot of the popular support inside the country um, and I don't think it's fair to discount personal accounts on the ground. Um, so what do you think about that? And also Israel have been known to um, they have hospital, they've been treating terrorists um, in their hospitals as well. So in terms of Israel as well, can you please touch on that? Um, and I guess, I guess the hypocrisy of the United States you know, there's a lot of other issues going on in the Middle East right now, like like I said, uh, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. You know, why do you think they've chosen to focus their attentions, you know, so much on Syria? It's only really explicable if you look at the geopolitics and consider the, the ambitions of imperialism. They've been spelled out, the imperial ambitions of the US have been spelled out very clearly, but because it's not part of the international system, neither international law nor international human rights. They can't express them in that sort of way. There are some people that express it in a way. There's a, there's a school of British historians called liberal imperialists, like including Niall Ferguson and some others, Robert Cooper, who talk about this idea that really, you know, the, the big power has to take control. But the, the tactic of empires has always been to control entire regions and exclude competitors. Who are the competitors? Russia, China, but also the Europeans. Uh, the US doesn't want good relationships between the Europeans and Russia, you know. So there's a, there's a big, it's a, there's a guy who wrote a very good book about India and the division of India, the partition of India, it's called In the Shadow of the Great Game. And that the partition of India was to do with the British view of how they would have a foothold in the region after they left India and India could have become the biggest and most powerful country on earth and, and it was partitioned. So the great game is what's going on in the Middle East, basically, and Syria is one step in that, and it's being done one thing at a time. That's why some people express surprise that uh, the US has recently withdrawn some sort of terrorist designation on the Iranian government or Iranian organisations, whereas four years ago we were about to have World War III on the basis of Iran and some supposed, another pretext, the, the, the supposed um, disarmament of Iran. So they're doing it one step at a time. They did it with Libya. Uh, they, did it, they, they tried to do it with Afghanistan, they tried to do it with Iraq, maybe they're failing in both cases. They did it in Libya, and Libya is a disaster. They're trying to do it in Syria, and for the moment, Iran's off the boil. But they can only really deal with... It's what surprises me why, why there's such a huge conflict in Ukraine and Venezuela at the same time, because in a sense, all empires die through overreach, basically. They get arrogant, their capacity wanes. You have to look at the, the great game to sort of see what, what they're about there. And they'll use what allies they can to divide the region, including Israel and the Saudis. Israel uh, bombed Syria many times. Israel. Mm -hmm. What is the rule of Israeli occupation in this crisis? And uh, if Israel bombed Syria again, what's the situation, how the situation will be, according to you? 
if I can answer that. I think um, Israel's role was trying to be very low-key because they're the most hated part of the region, basically. I mean, everyone hates them. If they don't hate them, they talk as if they hate them. The Saudis now have quite a close relationship with Israel because they both fear the, the influence of Iran. But Israel has intervened increasingly in recent years, uh, first of all with treating uh, fighters, taking them across the Golan border and so on, and then with occasional missile attacks at strategic times to try and assist the, the proxy armies. They now have got a quite well documented relationship with um, Jabhat al-Nusra as well as some of the other groups in the south there. Um, so they've played a low-key role, but they've been encouraged to, um, to play a stronger role now. But um, I think for a long time they pretended they weren't involved because um, they were told to keep their head down, basically. But clearly, uh, and some people were confused and thought that Israel had no interest in the outcome, but clearly what Israel fears most are the very strong relationships between uh, the resistance group in, in southern Lebanon, in Syria and Iran, and increasingly if Iraq cooperates with them, I mean, this is the US nightmare. If there is good neighbourly relations between Iran, Iraq, Syria and Lebanon, that's going to look bad for Israel because there will be a, a more of a united front there. Um, so that's really, in many respects, what promoting the sectarian violence is trying to do to prevent those groups coming together. And I thought it was quite significant that the, that the Iraqi government, whatever you think of them at the moment, uh, with Iranian assistance, went into Tikrit and did not ask for US air cover. Did not ask for US air cover, cover in a major operation like that. Um, what? Because they don't trust them. Because of these incidents that our friend over here is talking about. Now that's quite significant, and it, maybe these things take a long time to play out in Iraq. But that is, of course, why they set Saddam Hussein against Iran, they, to weaken both parties in the, in the 80s. So I think that's part of the big game. Do you think Israel will bomb uh, Syria again? Do you want to say something? Yes. Um, I think so. Sorry. Go ahead. The game yeah. has been changed. <laughs> my, my question is to the relevant panel members. Um, if the situation in Syria was referred to the International Criminal Court, what impact do you think that would have on the situation itself and possibly any foreign um, action against it? So, as you may be aware, this was the last um, action in the United Nations Security Council act of action on Syria, which failed upon the veto of Russia and China. Pretty much none. It was referred to the, UN, to the International Criminal Court. It's a very weak body still. It's uh, carried out only a couple of prosecutions. Um, referring that matter would be a political statement more than anything else. So I don't think that actually would change. Like it's we need a Security Council matter. Sorry? We need a Security Council matter. Yeah, this, well, you could do it through your Security Council mandate, um, but it, it, um, it wouldn't happen, of course. That would be a Security Council mandate. Russia's not going to support um, sending um, Assad for the International Criminal Court, so I don't think it's a viable way out of this at all. Um, question again for, uh, for Malcolm. Um, you feeling It's fine. <laughs> I said it along. Okay, so <clears throat> what I meant by that was um, Assad clearly is part of regaining control in the region. So my reading of uh, what's happening in this, the, the region is that one of the causes, among others, or a number of causes of this conflict is the disruption that was caused by the 2003 Iraq invasion by the United States. That the precursor to ISIS, for instance, was Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so there are all these different groups, uh, Islamist groups, who have wanted to gain power in different parts of the region. And so it's perfectly rational to do that at precisely the time when power is weakest. So if you remove the regime of Saddam Hussein, for instance, then there's a great incentive to come into the region from other parts of the world, which is why people flood in. And the region is so weak after that, and particularly after the so-called Hour of Spring, that all these groups have come in. And so. Um, when I say that Assad appears to be part of the solution forward, is that of all of these different disparate groups, and I make no judgment, I don't have perhaps the personal regard for Assad or some of the other people on the panel or in the room, but that, to me that's irrelevant. He's the person most likely to get, regain control in the country, and so working cooperatively, cooperatively with him there is a way of regaining authority for the country to stop the violence. What I mean by saying that I wouldn't see him necessarily as part of the further 
um, that the future of um, Syria, and this of course is somewhat speculative because anything could happen between now and then, but it obviously would be something of a lightning rod. Some, uh, many of these groups in the country are always going to see him as this figurehead who they would uh, want to fight. And so it's almost certainly the case that part of his Alawi um, regime would have to remain in power. Those are the kinds of arrangements that would be made in the future, but that's sort of the next step beyond working with the Saad, which is, appears to be where these um, intervening powers are moving towards, I would suggest. Can I just start? Yeah, in regards to the oh, sorry. position, you're saying in regards to the position that only like just war might happen on the ground, not uh, as a judgment of him as being a likely suitable or um, as a good uh, character to continue leading this in the universe, the Syria long term. Well, because um, he, at the moment, still has effective control over the army, um, or his brother does, or it's unclear exactly, but um, that's the reason for working with uh, Assad going forward. I, I do, uh, I mean, again, this is some of this is more anecdotal, as I'm discussing with um, Syrian expats, is many didn't like him when they lived there, but support him now for that very reason, that it's clear that he's the only person who's capable of governing in the country. They had no personal regard for him or didn't think that some said that they thought he was someone incompetent as a just a regular leader. Um, and so those are the kind of factors that would come into play if stability was regained. And so this again this is more speculative, but I wouldn't think that Assad is sort of going to be the leader in twenty years' time. Can I just like before we go on any further, I remember um, just a few days ago on, on Facebook actually, somebody commented on my wall and he and he said, I want Assad gone. Right? And I said to him, Are you Syrian? And he said, No. Turns out to be somebody living in Australia, and I said, "Well, who are you?" <laughs> no, I mean the Syrian people, as I've mentioned in my speech on in the June election last year, they made their choice, and so I think all of these questions as to whether he should go or whether he should stay, I have real ethical reservations about those of us living outside in, outside of Syria making that call personally. You said it today. You said it today. I, I had the, the, the interview with from uh, Iranian TV. Uh, so <coughs> the only people who can can take me out or give me this the Syrian people. Mm -hmm. So this is the, this is the Can I just say also, like the fact that Bashar al-Assad is going to be Syria's president in twenty years time is fine. That is not a victory for the West or a defeat for Syria at all. It's but we've been hearing that he must go, he must go, and this whole war has started apparently because he's a brutal dictator. But what was the alternative that was provided to Syria if Assad did go? Al-Qaeda? You know? It's just, elections were done. And if in 20 years' time an election happens and someone else wins the Syrian elections, that is fine. People, the Syrian army, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Syrians aren't dying for Bashar al-Assad. They are fighting to preserve their country, to defend their country. And so when we say that Bashar al-Assad is not going to be part of Syria's future, well, okay then, you know, if in 20 years' time he loses an election or in seven years' time he loses an election, that is okay. We support the democratic, democratic elections and the democratic processes that are happening now in Syria. I just want to add just, because, I, just, can I oh, just one other thing. I know you mentioned the lightning rod comment. Um, if you if you view um, Assad as like a lightning rod, then the issue there is that even removing him from, from power, like whether that's because he loses the next election or something like that, that would not take away the fundamental interests that it, that have coincided to uh, wage this proxy war against Syria. Those interests would still continue, regardless of whether Assad's in power or whether it's somebody else. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, I have a question for Malcolm, and you'll have to forgive me because I just dropped international law, so I never properly learned. I'm still teaching, you can always come back and take class. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, um, I'll think about it. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, as I understand, and as you've, I, think, I think you said, it, under international law, there are two, um, uh, two instances where it is legal to go to war against another country where the, the P5 have, or yep. the Security Council have mentioned it, and also where um, you're fighting in self-defense. And then, uh, uh, just as like a two-part question, firstly, are you saying that the, the Samantha Power argument that where uh, 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 some territory has lost any like effective sovereignty, 
um, in the instance of like collective self-defense. Is that like another exception under international law, or is it an extension of the second? That fits under the existing ones. Okay. If you accept that document, it's yeah. just a form of self-defense. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just to clarify, I think that you say that um, you uh, considered that uh, the responsibility to protect doctrine, which is really mainly only read by U.S. and U.K. academics and publications and things like that, um, it. The reason that it isn't being embraced by other states is because um, those states are concerned about the fact that um, it's the states themselves that make judgments about whether or not they, there is a responsibility to protect, and that um, it's mainly like political decisions. Um, isn't it foreseeable that the Samantha Power Doctrine similarly has the same kinds of like political decisions? And in an instance, for example, where um, a country is covertly backing insurgents or whatever and destabilizing a region, then that Samantha Power um, exception or extension of the second instance in which um, armed conflict is... Yeah. Um, International law is political. Yeah. To say that the sort of law, which is clearly just law, when there's politics over here, is a useful dichotomy for academics. But politics becomes part of the law. And so, you have a look at the doctrines of international law. The Security Council was designed around the five most powerful states of the world in 1945. And so, yes, every type of law, international law involving use of force or involves some form of self-judging. It's mostly only powerful states who use force in international affairs. And so, yes, that's about the power of doctrine of self-judging. But that's why it's important that, for instance, legal academics follow, and other people understand this and follow very close attention and criticise states who then fall outside of what's allowed. Um, and responsibility to protect um, is just policy guidance. It's not a legal basis for doing anything, really. Can I interject there? And it's, it, I mean, based on what a friend ever said, and also on um, a friend here who mentioned before about um, the supporting the rebels initiative to create a situation or to give the excuse for America coming in and coming with official airstrikes, and then what Samantha Power had now trying to you know, stretch out and first say, we have a responsibility to protect, tied with their saying, and even with the recent uh, improvement in relations between Asset and the US, but you know, Kerry's still saying that Asset must go. I mean, call it anecdotal or call it circumstantial, but it seems a lot of said that it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy by the American government to do this. So what's your position on the legality and also the, the, I guess, the moral right of America to be able to take that position? Well, I, I, I'd set up my position on the legality of it before, though I think it's legal in that limited case in northern Syria. Um, I think that the... But I mean, it, it, with the illegality of the situation created for them to, to go in illegally was came from illegal yes. things. Well, there's, the reality is that international law is sometimes about condemning states very loudly, but you can't take them to court. There is no court. So the, the, the case I cited much earlier about the iron contra the, the contra problem in the Nicaragua. Um, the United States was found to have used force illegally, and they responded by leaving the International Court of Justice and saying, we're not going to appear before this court ever again. So, I mean, you can't just take states to court and prosecute them. But it brings down, if you like, it creates a question mark over you know, the legitimacy of American foreign policy, for instance, in that case. Unfortunately, that's about as much as you can do when well, states have a lot of power. Can you be more specific about them saying that this should, as it must go, can you be more specific about Legality and the moral of that well, there's nothing illegal about somebody saying that that so and so must go as another country until you start taking actions, which as I said, they have taken actions. Yeah. Um, I would look at what the United States is doing more than what it's saying, of course, which is that one thing is that foreign policy in any state, but particularly a large state like the United States, you can't make sharp U turns. And so I think that something that might distinguish the approach I've taken from some of the other people here is that I'm less convinced about this idea of a grand scheme of the United States and that it's competently carrying it out and that there's some overarching purpose to everything. I think more often is that the United States, it's incoherent in its foreign policy. You just have to look at the attempt of Barack Obama to try and reach a nuclear deal with Iran and the fact that as part of that he's then embarrassed in his own country by the Congress bringing Benjamin Netanyahu into the Congress to speak against what the President's doing. The idea that the United States has some singular purpose and is able to achieve it, it's often obstructed internally. I appreciate what you're saying, but you're answering that. Like, I'm just going to get a right reply on that. Oh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll leave. I just want to answer your question. How many questions are you going to ask? I don't want to answer questions. I just want to respond to that one, which was that. Not answering the question. the question exactly. I mean, the position that America's taking now. Yeah. I mean. I'm not trying to obstruct it. Is it morally correct 
Yes. Or is it incorrect? Morally. Morally, well, illegally, I mean, I think you sort of wish around and say, yeah, it is illegal. But, yeah. I mean, the decision to take out an asset must go. In the context of everything they've done and the context of the situation now, what's your views on that? Um, I've said that that's the wrong policy to try and demand to decide to go. I think I, 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 I sorry. I Just to respond on the, on the grand plan. <laughs> um, every great power has a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. They don't get their own way, they move on to other things. This looks incoherent. Um, you know, they, it, well, so they run, they pull back from Iran. They don't want to take on Iran. Israel wants to push them against Iran. They're not ready for that. It's not off the agenda, but it looks inconsistent. They pull their, their plans to Iran because um, they've got their hands full. Okay, my question is for Jake. Um, earlier you were talking about the fundamental reasons or the underlying issues yeah. for you know, all these, this proxy war being waged on Syria and all these foreign interventions, right? Yeah. Okay, so going back there, do you believe a stable Middle East or even a stable Syria is... Well, well, I guess it's no secret that Syria supports the rights of the Palestinian people yep. and that they refuse to acknowledge Israel as a, um, as a legal state. Um, and so based on that and based on the relationship Israel and the United States have together, do you believe a stable Middle East and a stable Syria uh, would be a problem or, or um, against the interests of Israel and the United States? I think so. And um, also, sorry, just watch another right. thing. Um, Malcolm also said earlier, look at the things that the United States are doing and not what they're saying. Can you also comment on, on that? Because I, I think the United States, um, I guess since the beginning, they keep changing their story and they keep adapting it based on you know their interests and based on them trying to find a way to kind of wiggle their way into Syria. Mm -hmm. um, and also, Malcolm also earlier during his speech said that um, intervention in other countries, sorry, he spoke about the intervention of Raqqa being legal because of that whole great area about it being legal, um, because they're acting on the, on the interests of um, nationals in Iraq. Again, can you also tie that in with the rights of the Palestinian people and acting? Well, that's a lot of questions. But yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. But just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not, just on the first one about uh, stability, um, I think there are countries that have a vested interest in, in stability and um, like in, with an absence of death squads namely Iran, Iraq, and Syria, and Lebanon, right? And they've been working towards that. And I think one of the kind of, I think the material basis for this stability at one point was that um, they were planning on building a pipeline. So in 2007, uh, Qatar and, uh, and Iran basically discovered a lot of gas um, in the Persian Gulf. And then Iran proceeded to build a pipeline through its territory, through Iraq, into Syria. and. Um, the, the estimates that I've, that I've read is that if that pipeline had gone through, then eventually uh, Europe in particular would receive the majority of its oil and gas from two countries, Iran and Russia. And so that leads to an obvious um, competitive issue with Qatar, which, um, which would rather see uh, the, the gas production of those countries knocked out. And the other thing is, as soon as countries start building oil pipelines into each other, they, they hardwire relations, they, they're forced to become allies in this sense. And so that ties in very much to the, the question about the Palestinians, um, because to the extent that the Palestinian receives Palestinian resistance receives any support at all, whether that's um, you know medical aid, whether that's uh, military assistance, especially in the Gaza Strip, it's because of those countries in particular. So Iran, Syria, and of course Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, right? And so breaking that that axis, which is referred to as the axis of resistance, seems to be one of the, um, it's often commented as being one of the major motivations behind it, and I believe you asked another question as well. Um, hmm. Yeah, I was, just, I was talking about, you know, do, do you believe that the state in the Middle East or state in Syria is a, is a threat to the Israeli-US, um, well, I guess the yeah, Israel I in think the Middle so. East, and I mean, also, yeah. Yeah, I think one example of that is that um, uh, up until 2006, uh, Israel was negotiating with Syria about the return of the Jolan. Mm. And so one of the conditions that they gave, and they said, if you do this, this is Israel, they said, if you do this, there's a chance that you'll get that land back, is if you completely cut off funding for Hezbollah and make sure that they, they have, they're very, very limited in terms of their capability. That they own their guns, they've got no long-range missiles, nothing like that. Then the 2006 war happened, and ever since 2006, um, Syria has cooperated with Iran to make sure that Hezbollah has the most sophisticated missiles that it can possibly get, 
because a war of that scale happening again would be that much more damaging to the Lebanese people. And so Syria has basically uh, rejected those offers and basically said, we'll continue supporting uh, the resistance against Israel, whether that's in Gaza, whether that's, um, whether that's in South Lebanon in the form of Hezbollah. And uh, in many ways, it seems like this is the price that they're paying. Yeah, so. Can I speak to that, that yeah, young lady, please? <laughs> um, I, I found out through your speech and your films up there, I, I really didn't know much about Syria. Um, I didn't know that it had Christian and Muslim uh, religions in Syria. I had no idea what Syria was all about. But um, um, what I'm saying is I was really taken about um, what happened there. Um, it, it was very... Um, Sad to know that being a Christian Muslim country, which I, I didn't think had any religion whatsoever in it, to actually learn about that and to learn with such nice people like that, being Christians and Muslims, how things could actually happen like that. Um, I understand what you were talking about and all your pictures, but as far as politics go, um, I just got lost in all the political things, but I ended up coming back to what I heard from you, what I've seen from you. Um, when I first heard about Syria years ago, um, I was saying to my GP, um, I heard that you people, the, the people in parliament in Syria, were killing all its people with nerve gas. And I, I said to my GP, I'd, I'd love to go over there and help them out. And he, he, he understood what I said. But, um, yeah, I, I've learned a lot tonight. But um, I, was, I, I, I probably love Syrians more than what, probably what I ever did before. <laughs> with knowing what they've been to. <laughs> I didn't take it lightly. It's only recently I started going back to church again. And I do believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that it doesn't come lightly. But um, I'm, I'm just trying to do my best. But um, you know, I'm, I, I feel quite emotional about, you know, about what's happened tonight. And um, thank God for Syrian people and and their quest to have a, a good life and, and be known in the world. Well, thank you very much um, for that. It was very touching. And thank you very much for coming today. Um, but maybe something that you would also like to know is Ma'lula, the Christian town that I spoke about, is the only place in the world that still speaks Aramaic, which was the language that Jesus Christ spoke. Is that right? That is right. And it was protected by Hezbollah. It, it was protected and liberated by the Syrian army and Hezbollah's army. Yeah. You know, just one other point of interest. Um, I did go along to our Prime Minister's office and I wanted him or someone from the uh, ministry that the, him and I to go to Syria to try to talk dialogue and, and try to help Syrian people out. But I, I got a blunt refusal. Well, I'd just like to comment on uh, what I said. When I did go into Manula, I found a Syrian flag raised and a Hezbollah flag raised. And I asked them why they had the Hezbollah flag there, and they said, because Hezbollah came and liberated Manula, the Christian town, when the militants came and invaded. And if there's just one thing, one good thing you, you were to say about Syria, it's that minorities were protected in Syria. Oh.
And if you look at that, if you look at the region, in no country in that region, Christians lived as comfortable as they were in Syria. And when I was in Homs, I visited a Christian family and the wife said to me, we have never lived as comfortable as we are now than in the last 10 years. And of course, the 10 years is significant. That's when uh, Bashar al-Assad, you know, he came in into rule in 2000, but it's when his reforms started being implemented. And the, the, you, you know, this isn't something I'm making up. I'm not Christian, so. But when you, when you, when I went to these ancient sites and these churches, and just to see the destruction that has happened, just the theft of Syria's artifacts, it was heartbreaking. Very, very heartbreaking to see, to see all those things. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, it was hard. Off the back. Um, I think, I think strategically, strategically, um, the big powers haven't had their way, but because they have the allies in Turkey, they have the allies in Jordan, they have allies in Saudi Arabia and Qatar and the UAE and, and Kuwait's got their own brigade in Syria too. Um, while that happens, they can keep killing people. Um, they're not actually gaining ground, they're losing ground. They're losing ground in Aleppo, losing ground in the south. They, Syrian, they've got the Lebanese border more or less secured. They're gaining ground in, in the West, so you don't hear so much about it. But they can keep killing people so long as all those borders are porous, because as long as Turkey doesn't stop people going across, um, they can keep the conflict going. So it, it depends on a political solution that involves a number of those states. Just to reiterate what Tim said, uh, you, when you speak to people there, that, that's, that's what they say now. They believe, you know, give them a month and they would, they, 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 they could, you know, destroy ISIS, get rid of ISIS and get rid of all. But the fact that the borders are open yes. and they keep coming in, it's like an open tap, you know. And so they say we can kill a thousand of them today, two thousand more can come in. And until a political solution happens, until pressure, proper pressure is put on, especially Turkey, up the in the borders, north absolutely. and Jordan, to close their borders. Absolutely. The Syrian army is able to finish off the job. Yeah. Not just that, but Malcolm White isn't white. So, so she goes ahead of armor for the same just. Do you want to go to the two and the way? No, 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 you can go. Right. Okay, go. Um, so, my question is to you, Reem, and it's interesting that you brought up Aramaic and that they speak it in Mongol. I actually speak it myself, and I'm a Syrian, so my, my history is in the north of Iraq, and like you, I'm watching my history being wiped out, and it's extremely emotional. Um, but my question actually is just in the, just because you were just there in the last two weeks, it's been no, it's been 17 days since 200 plus Assyrians have been kidnapped from Harbor and they've been taken. And I know that we've had independent militias fighting. We know people that have taken the arms. Just and I know you're not a spokesperson for any army or anything like that. Was there anything? Was there anything on ground about any support for these militias? I know from what I've heard from the people I've been working with. They need arms, they can't do what they're trying to do there and fight off these attacks. And they're systematic and it's genocidal and these people are being killed. Is there any support to these militias on the hub? Or would you, you know? Well, I mean, I know I know somebody who's quite familiar with the area. His name's Nicholas Algin. Yeah, I'm actually quite a good friend. Oh, you're yeah. not? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, I mean, he told me, like, I spoke to him over the phone and he was telling me that um, there are 26 members that, of his family on the Kabul yeah. River. Um, a few of them were actually kidnapped, and I think right now they're in, a, uh, they're in this horrible situation where they've got basically a sheikh, a local sheikh, to basically um, negotiate um, with ISIS to try and let them go. But then ISIS said, if we find out that they're fighters, then they're going to be beheaded, you know. So it's quite horrible, obviously. But as for the support they're getting, 
Um, I know that there's there's basically two different um, uh, like Suriani, like sorry, Syriac, uh, yeah. like Syrian, Syrians, yeah, yeah. Uh, militias. I think one's they're both called Sotora. Yeah, Sotora. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, they're both uh, basically nominally allied either with uh, the, the YPG um, yeah. or with the Syrian army, depending on who's closer. Yeah. Based on what um, uh, Nicholas told me, he said that uh, a lot of the Sotoro fighters on the ground would prefer to be allied with the NDF because for their own reasons, and obviously the Kurds and the Assyrians have a long history, not, not always a pretty one, right? Yeah. They would prefer that the NDF and the Syrian army took over and gave them more assistance. Um, but then there's been three-way clashes recently between the Kurds as well, and that complicates the negotiation process for getting those Assyrians back. So at this stage, that appears to be the situation, but I might actually give Nicholas a call. And find <laughs> so that's, I, I was just wondering if... Okay, on, on the ground, I mean, I, I wasn't, you know, hanging around any army personnel, but, <coughs> but, but on the ground, with norm, normal people, I mean, when it, when it happens, it's, it's not like when we heard, of course, that the Assyrians were kidnapped and, and, you know, what's happening in Hasekah. Um, it's kind of like, you know, they, they, normal people are sympathetic because they know what's happening. They know what's happening because it happened to Syrians other than the Assyrians, other than the Christians. And so we completely understand what's happening. It's just like another part of Syria is being pillaged. So the Assyrians aren't you know, we don't, we don't, they're not separate to, to everyone else. And so we feel, yeah, yeah, I understand. So, but we are, you know, and I'm very sorry if, if you have any family involved, but it's, it's just like another part of Syria it's happened to. But I do know that the Syrian army is, does have, you know, activities up in, up in that region. And I received an, an update, I think about a, two weeks ago, um, that the Syrian army now, it's, it's advancing, it's controlling more and more, you know, it's getting controlled more and more in villages up in Hasekin. Um, but, yeah, as in, you know, specific military information, I don't know, but of course, the, the Assyrians are just another part of Syria, and they're just another part that makes Syria, you know, just the beautiful, you know, cultural mo mosaic that it is. They, um, no, no, I, I agree, I just wanted to know if there was, because in the past, it's has been very, very protective of the Christians. Heartbreakingly enough, the ones in Harvard are actually descendants of people that ran away from massacres in Iraq and settled in Syria. And now that they're facing this as well, I just wanted to know if there was any kind of government or military support for their country. There definitely will. Is military support? Um, you know, it's, 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 they're included in Syria. They're not, they're not a separate state. So there is military support. And you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's not considered, if that was taken over, then it's not considered to be separate to Syria right, at absolutely. all. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Russia um, and India did sign off on the elections as being legitimate, um, but then also the UK is um, viewing them as illegitimate. Yeah. But surely both of you know these countries they all have interests in these yeah, in this absolutely. area and special motives for either declaring it one way or the other. Was there an independent body? No, and there's a reason for it. So 2014 presidential elections, the UN basically said that they wouldn't be sending monitors because um, they questioned the legitimacy of uh, an election like that being undertaken in a situation where there's a war, basically. So they didn't actually send anyone. So there's no... No. So, but, but those countries that did send, like, monitors, and I know one of them, his name's uh, Feroz Miti Borwala, he's from India, um, they pretty much all uh, said that it was quite legitimate, uh, that there wasn't an issue with it. Um, as for the countries, as for, like, the United Kingdom, as for the United States... Um, those countries, like, to the extent that they're critical of the results of those elections, um, they didn't send anyone. And the only reasons that they provide are, um, are almost self-referential and circular. So the United States basically said, you can't have um, a free election in a, in a society that doesn't have a free society or something like that. And then if it doesn't have a free society, then you can't have a free election. So then the, the reasoning becomes circular. The other countries, like the Gulf countries, basically said that... Um, uh, what was it? That the, the, el the elections weren't illegitimate because Syria has had so many refugees, and indeed, they, they have. Then all you have to do is point to the participation rate of 73%, which is significantly higher than a lot of other countries where their democratic credentials, when they have participation rates of 50% or 60%, aren't really questioned. So yes, you're right, it is a political question. As the to countries that were critical of the election were also the very ones that, that were fueling Syrian people voting in their own country. And that means that they were certainly not able to be pressurised by the Assad regime if they were in countries like the UK, Australia, America. But they still didn't let those people vote. Why? That's, that's, that's why exactly right. Yeah. What happened in Lebanon, on the day of the elections, they actually closed down the whole of Beirut. <coughs> I don't know if you're aware of it, if you've seen it, the whole country came to a standstill because people were waiting in line so they can go and vote. Hmm. Last question. Hey, my last question is for Malcolm. Malcolm, it's no secret that Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been uh, funding and um, funding ISIS through their Muslim Brotherhood and also um, through their state-owned television stations like Al Jazeera. They've had prominent figures in their religious uh, like religious shapes releasing buffers for genocide in Syria, and they've actually played a major role um, in encouraging jihadists in the region to go into Syria and to uh, commit genocide and murder and atrocities in there. Um, now, United States and, and Saudi Arabia and Qatar have very strong relationships. Why isn't the United States placing more pressure on their allies in the region to stop what is clearly a proxy war on Syria and to stop them from going in there and, and, and committing these atrocities. I mean, you go on about, you know, wanting boots on the ground and, and all this intervention in Syria, but why don't you address the root cause of the problem? As it was being said earlier, I think you were saying, every time they kill a thousand of them, another thousand are being sent in. So why aren't you addressing the root cause of this? Uh, I mean, it's that last, you know, why isn't Syria left for the Syrians to deal with? Clearly you can't and it won't. As long as the I'm going to say anything about boots on the ground first of all, I don't think that's a good at any point. Oh, sorry, um, in Syria. I meant the, the US yeah, yeah, I narrative, not the um, I mean, clearly um, there are these connections through the Gulf states in terms of supporting some of the terrorist groups who are fighting in um, Syria against the regime. Uh, I would again suggest that uh, much of um, American policy has been incoherent and done on the hop, if you like. That, uh, there is, uh, Tim mentioned this earlier actually, that a very strong influential idea in American foreign policy is this idea of American exceptionalism. And it's a, legitimate, a genuine belief among policymakers that America has this special role. The empirical evidence doesn't support that at all, but it is a real thing in the sense that policymakers genuinely believe that this does guide American foreign policy, that America has something to offer. And so during the Arab Spring, many policymakers responded that they thought that this was this real awakening in the Middle East. And so um, the response of the United States was to support some of these groups who were fighting in these individual countries, but it was always a completely misguided policy. And so the question about how do you balance the relationship between Saudi Arabia and all these other countries, the nature of being a global power is trying to form relations 
around the world with different countries. America has very few friends in the region. It does have friends such as Saudi Arabia. It's a very problematic relationship. It causes embarrassment with some of the human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia. But the United States isn't solely focused, and I don't think anyone thought here thought they were, solely focused mm -hmm. on promoting democracy and human rights. That does form part of the worldview of the United States, and then that's balanced against geopolitics, which is that there's a powerful country who supports the United States. And so that's why there are these um, inconsistencies, but those inconsistencies are real. That's part of the policy of working in the Middle East. We've got all these different countries, and you'll never have sort of one approach which will be consistent with everyone, because every country has its own history and culture and different allegiances, and that's the nature of America's engagement in the region. Saudi Arabia is the biggest customer for weapons. I mean, what a coincidence. Yeah, I, 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 it's I, I, common I, I, weapons in the, in the Middle East, the uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Martin, Israel. Sorry, like just in response to what Malcolm said. Sorry, Malcolm. Um, Gee, coincidence. Based on, just, just quickly, based on what you said, Malcolm, it is a little bit hypocritical because a lot of, um, a lot of the United States reasons and pretenses to go in to um, uh, the causes for the human, humanitarian intervention are based on moral, moral and ethical grounds. Having said that, if they're going to take moral and ethical stances, then they should do that across the board. They shouldn't just pick and choose. How can they maintain these relationships with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, knowing what they're doing and knowing they're, they're, that they play a massive role in what's happening in Syria? The just, policy of any, I'll say one last thing. Address it properly, sorry. Yeah, um, the, the policy of any great power is never going to be consistent all of the time, and that's not a defence um, necessarily, but. Um, the idea that any great power has been consistent all of the time, you've got lots of different relations. And there are different individuals, the example I gave them, but, um, Obama being opposed within his own country, there are different interests within the country, and then there are different interests in the region they're engaging in. So, so yes, in other there will words, be hypocrisy. they have too many invested interests in Saudi Arabia, like oil, for example. So that, that'd, that'd, be you, that'd be your take okay, on Okay, so... Can you continue your yeah. discussion with everyone? Yeah. Oil, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for